Yep. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, today is day four of connecting the dots, and it's you know it's been a great informative week with presentations by Patty, Joey, and Jeff. It's great to see so many new and familiar faces today as well. Tomorrow at uh, 10 a.m. will be the panel discussion and review of ideas based on the prompts you were provided. So I hope all of you can join us again tomorrow at uh, 10 o'clock. We are pleased and honored to have Paul McGee with us today. Paul is a 93 grad of RIT. And, and by the way, the album of the year in 1993 was Unplugged by Eric Clapton. And Paul, I'll bet you own a copy of that. I actually do not. I mean, <laughs> okay. Paul has a proven history of successfully leading innovative human-centric uh, design teams in varying companies and cultures. His experience ranges from working cross-functionally uh, to develop a design-aware culture within a corporation. And that's very difficult to do, folks. Uh, to, to also refine the reach, uh, methods, and focus of a well-established design team in transition. The result is 90 patents for Paul and his teams have won hundreds of international design awards for their thoughtful, human-centric execution. Paul has over 25 years of corporate design development and management experience as the former director of strategic design and brand management at Diebold, and is currently director of industrial design for the Americas at Crown Equipment Corporation in Ohio. Beyond his passion for design, Paul is a true gearhead that enjoys cars, motorcycles, and racing. Please welcome Paul. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Bruce. That's it. It's Appreciate it. Um, so uh, thank, thank you everybody for tuning in. Um, what we're gonna walk through today is, oh, hold on a second here. All of a sudden I'm not able to advance. There we go. So uh, what I was thinking we'd go through today is I'm gonna give you a little bit about me. Bruce just, gave you a pretty good abstract of a lot of the things that we may cover there, but I'll, I'll dig in on a couple areas. Um, we're going to talk about some really hard truths. We're going to, we're going to start by discussing the things that are probably not the most fun things to discuss, but I think those are really important things to talk about. Then we're going to talk about the things that we think will be helpful for you to know as you begin your path into a professional career and then move into the more actionable side of it, which is the things that you can do uh, to help guide yourself through your, your journey and your career as a designer. Then we'll summarize uh, everything we've covered and then we'll close by uh, giving you an exercise to hopefully exercise uh, some of the things that you've learned during this time, okay? So digging in a little bit about me, uh, you'll see every now and then at this section head, I'll throw some pictures in here just to kind of break up the boredom. Uh, one of the things that I like to do is, in addition to all the automotive stuff, I'm trying to learn photography. So a lot of, all the photos that you'll see here are actually photos that I've taken myself over time. And they're ones that just make me happy. So frankly, it's a little bit selfish that I put them in here <laughs> just because they make me smile. So uh, as Bruce said, I graduated uh, ID class of 1993. Like Jeff told you yesterday, we had the opportunity at those times to uh, double major. I actually was in a in a branch path where I was exploring graphic design and industrial design. But I always my my dream when I was younger was I always wanted to design cars. Uh, but I frankly didn't. This was uh, <laughs> the days before the internet, so learning about things was a little bit more challenging than it is now. So I actually didn't even know what I didn't know back then. Uh, I, I've spent 18 years at Diebold. Uh, as, as Bruce said, I, I pretty started Diebold in 1995 as a uh, staff designer, basically a mid-level staff designer. And over time, I managed to navigate my way into some leadership opportunities and became the head of design for, for Diebold. And that was about, about the time I left, it was bordering on about a $5 billion company a lot of people won't even recognize the name, but that's because our product is out there basically representing other companies. If you've been to a bank or you've done anything in banking, there's a really good chance that you've interacted with product that, that was created from the company I worked with. Um, I hate to confess to this, but if you voted on a piece of electronic equipment, there's about a 50-50 chance that I uh, designed that. 
<laughs> and I know that that's always a sensitive subject, but basically uh, anything that had to do with securing items of value for 18 years, that was what was my responsibility. Uh, about eight years ago, almost uh, within about one month, I'll be at my eight year anniversary at Crown Equipment. I left Diebold in 2013 to come to Crown Equipment. Uh, at that time, Diebold was undergoing a lot of executive uh, leadership change and it just wasn't very clear what the future was gonna be. I'd had a longstanding relationship with some folks at Crown uh, professionally and they talked about an opening. So I decided to pursue that. And so for the last eight years, I've been the uh, head of industrial design for the bulk of what we uh, produce uh, when it's, it says it covers the Americas, my responsibilities or, or any product that we sell that is created and produced in North America, no matter where in the world we sell it. So there's still a, a very heavy international uh, component to that. So between Crown and, and Diebold, uh, the products that we sell have, you know, are placed in probably over 100 different countries. And uh, so we, we have to be very conscious about uh, not just what we see outside our door, but what goes on in different areas of the world. So uh, again, like Bruce said, the, the teams that, that I've led have won <laughs> literally hundreds of different design awards. Uh, personally, I've, I've got somewhere between 85 to 90 patents, depending on which countries you wanna put in account, uh, mixed pretty evenly between utility and, and design patents. A uh, long time ago, I served on the board of IDSA for, for several stints. And uh, I've, I've served as an advisor for uh, the Cleveland Institute of Art to help them establish some of their different design disciplines as they became uh, more multimodal than just uh, transportation and industrial design. So that's a little bit about me professionally. On a personal level, like uh, Bruce said, I'm a big gearhead. I love cars, motorcycles, racing, anything like that. I've been trying to get a little bit better about photography. Um, of course, like everybody on the call, you know, we, we all like good design. And uh, I also try to get into cooking. I think that sometimes that's a nice way to exercise some creative outlet. So uh, over this time, I just, you know, I feel like I've learned a lot. And if I'm in the spirit of being very open with everybody, I've, I've done some things right, but I've made an awful lot of mistakes. And so uh, my goal today is to kind of share those experiences and learnings with you. And of course, your experiences are not going to be the same. Uh, but I think that a lot of what we're going to cover are foundational truths that will always be present. They may look and feel somewhat different, but I think the essence of uh, the things I have to share will probably be fundamentally true. So we ready to dig in a little bit? All right, so uh, let's get started. Uh, if you learn nothing else today, the next two slides are probably the most important slides of something that I can leave you with. So it's very important that you screen capture or get your camera out or do whatever you're gonna do. So are we ready? All right, well, we're gonna start with teaching you how to make bread, okay? This is what you need to make bread. This is specifically no need bread. And I'm not, this is something I've been doing for 10 years. This is not a pandemic thing where everybody's been in their kitchen and posting Instagrams of their sourdough. This is something that I had a good friend that I, I raced with that taught me this about 10 years ago. And it's the simplest, best bread you can make. And you should genuinely learn how to do this. This is very important. So if I'm, I'm going to make a very, very strange metaphor and we're gonna keep coming back to that. So over the last several days, you've been hearing from from Joey and Jeff and Patty about all these different skills that you are absolutely going to need to be able to utilize in your professional career. So you can view these ingredients like the things that you've been learning either from your professors or from seminars like this. You need three cups of flour if you're gonna make this bread. You need two teaspoons of salt. You need a half a teaspoon of yeast and you're gonna need one and a half to one and five eighths cups of warm water. All right, so get that down. Now what you're going to do is mix those ingredients together. And I don't think you need anything special. You don't need any big stand mixer. You put those things in a bowl and you make your hand look like a claw and you put them in there and you just mix them with your hand. Okay. Now what you're going to do is you're going to pour the water over the back of your hand and slowly introduce that water. And you're just going to use your hand and mix all those things together. You leave that last 
eighth of a cup because the water level may vary depending on the kind of dough you use. But what you want to do is keep mixing that water and until that, that dough starts to stick to your fingers. And it should look a little more wet than if, if you're used to making bread. It's going to look kind of gooier than it should. And, and it's going to stick to your hands and be kind of messy. But just when you're done mixing everything together, just put the dough in the pot, get it all off your fingers, and then you're going to get a really tight cling wrap over the top of the bowl. And if it doesn't stick, put a rubber band around it. And you're just going to, that's it. You're done. You put a rubber band around the top of the bowl, put it off to the side, and you let it sit for 12 hours. Okay. When you come back after 12 hours, that thing is going to be about three or four times the size of when you left it. And after that, you're going to take it out. You're going to put it on a floured surface and you're going to fold it four times, left to right, right to left, top to bottom, bottom to top. And you put it back in the bowl and you let it sit for 90 minutes. Okay. At least 90 minutes. You can do a couple hours. The good thing about it is it doesn't care. Let it sit a little longer, a little shorter. It doesn't matter. So do you think we're done? We actually haven't even really gotten started, but we've taken all of our skills and we've put them into this. But I'm gonna come back to that. Now we're gonna start talking about some of the hard truths. And I share these ideas not because they're easy to hear, but because most of, the, uh, most of you in time are gonna experience some version of what I'm sharing. And with the benefit of hindsight, these are things I wish I had known when I was starting my career. And it really shouldn't be your instructor's jobs to share these things with you because <laughs> their job is to inspire you and educate you. And it's, it's people that have been out there that can come back and tell you where the landmines are and what not to, what not to touch. So these are some of those hard truths that I should share with you. And let's start with number one, you have no pot. All right. Now, I suppose that could be considered many different ways. I'm not talking about whether you have uh, any kind of <laughs> recreational drugs in your house or anything like that. What I'm simply saying is you don't have, back to the bread analogy, you don't have anything to cook your bread in. You made a, you mix it in a bowl, but you can't cook it in that bowl. The second learning is you have no oven. You have no way of cooking this bread. So you've made this wonderful concoction, but you have no way on your own of doing anything further with it. So as relates to this bread, as, as relates to many things, uh, the, the key idea here is your ideas will be reliant on other people to see it done. Your ideas alone are not sufficient to be out to the world unless you have millions of dollars and find, you know, infinite resources at your disposal. You need to work with other people to see your ideas executed. So let's get on to our next big idea here. People do not understand what you do as a designer. They, they will tell you that they do, which is actually even more dangerous in a way. But the reality is, is they don't understand exactly what you do. They may think they do. You know, you guys make things look pretty. You know, you, you kind of make them ergonomic. But at the end of the day, you need to acknowledge that people don't understand what you do. To this day, my own mother doesn't have a clue how to describe what I do for a living. That's just a, that's a hard truth. Another hard truth is that uh, they don't think what you do is as important as you know it is, okay? They may underrate that. Certain companies have a very engineering-centric culture. Other ones have a marketing-centric culture. Some have a design-centric culture, but that's a minority of companies. And they may know that design is important, but then even the people that you might work with will still not fully understand the, the significance of what you do. And let me give an example of that. At Diebold, uh, you know, I, I think I had a reasonable amount of success in growing the importance of design in that company. But even toward the very end, you know, the 75 or 80 percent of Diebold's income came from ATMs. And if I were to straw poll everybody on this call and ask, when's the last time you used an ATM? I'm going to guess the answer is not very frequently. And I'm going to guess if I asked you now versus 10 years ago, it would be less now than it was 10 years ago. And so as designers, we saw the trend in what consumer behavior was like. But the people that we worked for said, well, your job is just to make the products that we want to build better products. And we're telling them that we need to be making different products. 
So the idea is we knew our job was more than just designing a product. Our job was to tell them where directionally people were going, right? What the experience they wanted from Diebold. Even to the point where, you know, this is probably a 10 or 12 year old picture now where we were still using the ATM, but we'd even developed an idea to tell them that we needed to move into the digital realm by by creating applications and things that would bridge between uh, mobile devices and our machines. And we started to try to make that pitch that we needed to start to focus more on digital uh, devices and mobile devices. And unfortunately, we, we didn't end up, uh, we, we, we had some success. We got them to help do some digital confirmation devices, but the company had so much invested in the making of big physical objects that it, it basically wasn't willing to turn itself around. And while the company is still around, it's economically uh, much less profitable now than it was when I left eight years ago. I'm not, that's not related to me. I think that's related for their lack of willingness to change direction. Another hard truth is that your goals and desires as a designer are not going to match up with the other people that you work with. You have things that are very important to you that you think the product needs or that the experience needs. Your peers and other organizations, the people that you work with, they will have different thoughts about what's important. And it's not that any of you are wrong, but that that's where you're going to have this tension in the system. And you're going to have to figure out how to manage that, that tension in what you want in the product. Here's an example of that. Everybody familiar with what this is? And this is, if you've been to a grocery store anytime in the last decade, you're probably familiar with this. This is a self-checkout device in the grocery store, which ironically is also, if people want money, the way they often get their money. When we were at Diebold, I'll share a little picture with you. This is a standard one that I think, you know, this might be a Fujitsu product that you'd see at any grocery store today or some version of it. This is a picture that I, did in 1996 in my first year at Diebold, I think I was three years out of university or so. And this was me trying to convince the company that there was merit to this idea that this was something that we should get into because at the time the machines were just dispensing change on a transaction. And I actually got a lot of the equipment, we put it together, we built this model, gave an executive presentation and the outcome of that was that we ended up selling the cash dispensers to companies that would make this, but we decided not to get into that because we didn't think there was any future in this business. We were wrong. So another hard truth, and this one's a little tough to swallow, but designers are really not good storytellers. And I, I'm really sorry, but that's just, that's just the truth. Um, we're really good at telling stories to each other, but I don't think that we're fundamentally as a profession good at telling stories to other people that are not designers. Okay. By the way, if, if there's questions or comments as we go, uh, please feel free to jump in. Here's another one that I learned very early on. Decisions are going to get made for reasons that you just won't always like. And sometimes there's just nothing you can do about that. <laughs> I remember uh, one of the big innovations that we created on ATMs back in the late 90s, which are now on pretty much any ATM you see, was we came up with the idea of putting mirrors on the corners of the ATMs so that it, we, we found out that there were parts of the world in particular where, where crime, while people were having a transaction ATM, was very high. So we came up with the idea of putting uh, awareness mirrors on the corner so you could at least see what was going on behind you as you were performing a transaction. The idea of what the optics of that mirror were going to be was practically a science project. We needed it to be uh, the, a shape enough that I could see a broad field behind me but then when you do that, oftentimes the objects look very small. So you had to find the perfect balance of making the objects look large enough to identify, but broad enough to, to see a large field. We worked for probably six weeks to get the mirrors exactly to the right curvature to be able to see what we wanted to see. The CEO came down to do a design review 
and the CEO at the time was a little bit of a character. And he happened to be walking his wife through the office uh, that day. And he was showing off the equipment and how proud he was of everything that we were doing. And she walked up and chose to use the mirror uh, as a way to check the quality of her makeup and said that it was too hard to be able to tell whether she had applied her lipstick correctly. And we ended up having to change the shape of the mirrors to make sure that people could check themselves in it. <laughs> so the entire value of what we were doing, it took probably another two months to get that decision unwound. And it wasn't based in anything to do with uh, logic or reason or anything that was the reason we created the idea in the first place. So, you know, we have to recognize that sometimes decisions are going to be personal. They could be uh, internally political in nature. Uh, it could just be that there's different motivations or uh, gravitational forces at play. And you're not always going to like it. So with all this in mind, and because of all these truths, I regret to inform you that the merit of your work is going to be very important, but that alone is probably not going to be enough to get your ideas executed the way you'd like to see them executed, okay? You need to be good at what you're doing to be sure, but that's probably not gonna be enough. So you're gonna need to work with other people. You're going to need to be able to make compelling cases for the things that you'd like to get done. Uh, you know, so this is an imminently solvable problem. Uh, you, you largely can, you know, this is the part I always find kind of odd and frustrating about designers. A lot of us say, well, we're not equipped to do that. And I'm saying actually the exact same tools that you learn as designers are the same tools that can help you with this challenge as well. So let's get back to, uh, Moving on from the uh, hard truths, let's talk about some things that you need to know to maybe help you navigate your way through some of those hard truths. So first thing you need to know is Greek. I don't suppose anybody knows Greek. Okay, so what this translates into is know thyself. Okay, and this, that former Greek phrase was one of three phrases that uh, was on the basically the entryway of one of the Colosseums in old Greece and the other two maxims that were carved in those stones were there was know thyself the second one was nothing to excess and thirdly and this one actually comes into play later here is surety brings ruin and the idea here with uh with this one is in, in this context, it was Oceanus was telling Prometheus that he should know better than to speak ill of the one who decides his fate. And accordingly, perhaps he should better know his place in the great order of things. Okay, so before we can move forward, we have to know who we are before we can start telling other people what we think they should do. So we also need to make sure that we know who our audience is. And I'm going to go back through and, and get into detail in each one of these, but first step is to know who you are. The second step is to know the people that you need to interact and engage with. And then the third step is to understand the environment or the landscape of where you're working and who you're working with, et cetera. So going back to knowing yourself, I think you have to genuinely always be checking in with yourself and understand what makes you happy. Um, as an individual, as a, as a practicing professional, where do you find uh, joy in, in what, what kind of work? Uh, what, what kind of things reward you? Jeff and I talk all the time. We have very, very different jobs. Um, I don't know that Jeff dislikes or likes the kinds of things that I do versus what he does, but you know, we know that Jeff, for example, finds an insane amount of joy in, in his illustration and sketching. Me personally, I'm not good at it. I, I don't find that to be as enjoyable as other things. So Jeff's career has taken a path that kind of favors the things that he finds some joy in. And I found uh, similar paths, but I think you need to be aware of those things so that when you're asked to make decisions that have gravity on your career path, you can, you can be self aware enough to know how to move in the right directions. So I look at my own staff and, and I've got 
people on my team right now that are one year to two years out of school to people that have been practicing professionals for almost 40 years. And some of them have very aspirational, like they, they'd like to run the world. They want to be CDO of, you know, Apple. I've got people that have been practicing for 40 years that are perfectly happy to just keep drawing, sketching, building an occasional model, and none of them is wrong. And there will always be a place for those people in, in, in our design organization. But I think the trick is to know yourself well enough to know what it is that, that you want to do. You need to know what rewards you. Even within developing a product, do you want to see your product commercialized out in the world? Uh, do you find more joy in just making people's lives better? Uh, do you think you want to work in a consultancy? Do you want to work in a corporation? Do you want to live in a certain part of the country? Uh, do you, like, I, I think I remember listening to Joey say, like, he wanted to do shoes. It was really important to him to do shoes. Okay. There's no wrong answer here, but I think you have to be very honest with yourself about what you want to do and what you're willing to do. And you're going to have to make these choices, but I think it's important to, to walk through this conversation and be frank with yourself and even write it down or, or, or be conscious of it versus just have these things happen to you. The other part of knowing yourself is, is to be self-aware, not just about what you like and what you want, but about uh, the, on the more daily issues and efforts, uh, you need to be honest with yourself about what you do well, maybe what you're not as, as good at. Like back to my comment, if I'm perfectly honest, like I was, I was never a good sketcher. I'm, I'm still to this day, I'm a horrible sketcher. Um, and and it, as my career went forward, I had to figure out what I could do to compensate for that or what other ways I could I could use to manifest that. Now your professors are probably cringing because I'm not saying you don't need to know how to sketch. What I did was wrong. This is the bad lesson learned, but I had the ability to compensate for that through some other, other skills and strengths. And also like there are things that are gonna be unique to every one of you. And I think you need to highlight those. I can tell you for every member of my team what their precise strength is. And I put them in positions to leverage their strengths so I've got some people that are phenomenal idea generators, but they're horrible with people. <laughs> so, so we might not put them in a crowd, but man, if I've got a big, nasty, hairy problem, I'm going to give it to that guy. And I'm just going to tell him like, okay, well, and when you're done, why don't you share with me what you've done? <laughs> but, you know, we've got people with all kinds of different skills. There's a place for everybody, but you need to be honest with yourself about that. So to knowing your audience, Working with people is an insanely big part of the job. Um, it doesn't matter if you work for a corporation or a consultancy. It doesn't matter if you're a staff designer or a chief design officer, you're gonna need to work with other people. Um, you need to know what their motivations are. You need to have different, uh, understand if they have different drivers, do they have different styles or cultures? And in these last three questions, they may sound very familiar because in reality, what you're practicing in understanding this is empathy. And as we all know, that's an incredibly important part of the design process is, is the act of empathy. But oftentimes as designers, we take empathy and only think about it as it relates to informing a product. And what I'm suggesting to you is that same tool used internally is going to be very powerful in helping you promote your ideas to move them forward. And the third thing you need to know is, is the environment, like we talked about. And this one gets a little bit trickier. This is one that I think you'll, five years from now, 10 years from now, some of you are gonna probably go, okay, I understand this one a little bit better. But there's the problem that you're going to be asked to solve. And then there's the problem that actually needs to be solved. Sometimes they're the same things. A lot of times they're not the same thing. And so, for example, um, I think about a lot of my time at Diebold and, uh, you know, people would say, uh, you know, we need this machine to be like, I, I'll give you a great example. Um, one of the biggest learnings we made right around the time when digital media was starting to become bigger, we were moving from machines that were very just functional and dispensed money to ones that were a little more multimodal. And the biggest bank in the United States was placing an insanely large order. And they came in very upset with us and they said, well, your machine takes longer 
from the time people ask for their money until the time the money shows up versus your competitor. So we're going to buy from your competitor. We set up a big lab, we did a giant test, and we found out that our machine was actually 10% faster than the competitors was. But the reason that, so, so the original ask was make the machine faster. What we in the design group realized is the reason that it felt, the reason that it, the bank came in and thought that it took longer was because it just felt longer. So from that, we actually grew the function of interaction design in Diebold <laughs> and basically put animations up on the screen to better inform people about what was going on while it was happening. We changed nothing about the machine's capabilities to dispense money, put it back to the bank and all of a sudden, oh, well, this is so much better. But that was not the question we were asked to solve. That was understanding what the real problem was. The problem wasn't the clock, the problem was the perception of time. And that's often what we need to understand is what people are asking of us is what they think the fix to the problem is. But sometimes our job is to better understand. Now, we know when we focus on design problems that we want to dig in, but I'm suggesting that that's still often true when you're working inside of an organization. And part of that empathy is understanding what their currency is. And in currency, it may mean money, but I don't mean currency as only money. So something I'm still to this day trying to teach a lot of designers is, you know, as, as designers in a lot of cases, we're, we're idealists, we're, we're, we, we want utopia, we want the best answer for everything all the time. And what I'm trying to perpetually teach my team is we need to know the terrain, we need to know the climate and the environment. If the project can only bear three months in this amount of money, what are we going to do in that time. You can often hurt your reputation and you can hurt the importance of design by not recognizing what the situation can bear. So I think it's very important that when you're out in the world working someplace that you're recognizing that there are times to push and there's times to understand what that circumstance can bear. So, you know, what, what you do in school is really no different than what happens in the, the real world in that sense. But, if, you know, where you have a, a semester or a quarter that you must get a project done in. But in, in a company, sometimes it might be a price point for a product. It might be uh, time to market. It may be just trying to get in front of a competitor. You, you need to acknowledge those as part of your design brief. And just be aware of what, what the situation can, can tolerate. And that'll pay big dividends because a lot of this input is not about just designing the product. It's about recognizing that this is about building credibility of, and trust that pays big dividends over time. Your career is not going to be fully made or fully killed by one project. It's going to be an aggregate total of how you interact over time. So let's talk about things that we can do, okay? So with those, within those three big ideas, specifically, let's go back to what things you can do. So within understanding yourself, uh, the biggest thing you can do is just be self-aware. Like we talked about, you really need to just know what your, what your strengths are. You need to know enough about yourself to present yourself fairly and, and honestly. In terms of knowing your audience, like we talked about, I think practicing empathy is a really, really uh, important skill that needs to transition from just informing a product to also the way we engage with, with people, clients, bosses, <laughs> other disciplines, et cetera. And within that, I think it's really important to be flexible. And, and what I mean by being flexible, that gets a bit back to the storytelling idea, which is Oftentimes, the way you have to engage or interact with people is, is to know that this, you know, a lot of these decisions are negotiations. And it's important to acknowledge that as designers, we are not always going to get our way. And you need to make choices, but that involves being flexible and working with people to figure out what the best collective option going forward is. It's, it's, it can often be compromised. And I know that there's some people in design that will tell you you should never compromise. And 
there's times that you shouldn't compromise, but there's there are times you absolutely should. So I don't think that you should ever view compromise as, as, a, as a dirty word. And within knowing the environment, this is a really, really big idea. And I, I don't know how to emphasize it strongly enough, but you need to be situation aware. I've got young designers that are incredibly savvy about this. I've got designers that are nearing retirement that have no idea what situational awareness means. You need to know when you're giving a presentation or when you're pitching your idea or when you're doing something, get a lay of the land. Make sure that you understand. Let me give you an example of that. I, in, in my current company, I, I will try to not give names because you may know some of these names. I would often give presentations and you could tell the minute one of the executives would walk in the room, what kind of a mood that executive was in. And I could almost very predictably tell you how the meeting was going to go before the meeting even started just by the tone of, of the person walking into the room. So we actually developed a system between me and some of my lead designers that we would be ready at the, you know, <laughs> in milliseconds at the beginning of the meeting to decide whether to basically bail the meeting and reschedule it. You know, we would call it, oh, we're just going to give you a quick update. We don't need any decisions. Or if the, if the person coming into the room was in a really good idea, we would try to get all the decisions possible decided in that meeting while they were in a good mood. So it was genuinely about just trying to know those subtle nuances of, of the environment to know how to move your, your ideas forward as, as successfully as possible. And it was silly. I mean, we're you know, we're completely adjusting schedules around the behavior and attitude of one person. I've had conversations where, for example, one of my former bosses, I told his secretary, uh, his, his admin at one point, please quit setting up conversations with me and him anytime after 3 p.m. because typically that was when he would have a very hard time keeping his eyes open and staying awake. So I would actually have to ask <laughs> to have the meetings at certain times of day when I know he would be very lively and attentive. And we'd have to do little things like uh, one of my bosses, when we got relocated, uh, I noticed over time that we were located to a spot where he wouldn't often visit us. And we were seeing that we were out of sight and out of mind on some decisions. And I also knew he had a sweet tooth. So we actually did little things like put out a bowl of candy in our area. <laughs> knowing that he would come in and take candy and then just start having these conversations with us and start looking around and paying attention and asking questions. And if you notice the thread to a lot of these ideas is they have absolutely nothing to do with the quality of our work or design. They have everything to do with managing the relationships that you have with non-designers. And I know this sounds silly and I know it sounds like stuff you don't want to think about, but, but here's the reality. I spent way too many years early in my career thinking that those things weren't meaningful or important to what we do. And I'm here to tell you that they matter. So my advice to you is, you know, stay tuned into them and, and they'll probably give you a lot less friction and, and it'll pay dividends as your career continues forward. Okay, so these are kind of big ideas and all these will help you uh, in your relationships, they'll help you be better storytellers. They'll make you and in the craft of design better appreciated and valued, and you'll be an easier person to work with. Okay, now let's let's talk about some more practical tactics. Okay, so these are things that you can start practicing immediately. They're slightly more ground level, and every one of these is very important. And I don't care where you are in your career or where you work; all of these are true. Okay. You should deal in facts whenever possible. And, and what I mean by that is, is you're allowed to have your opinions, but to the degree that you can inform your beliefs in facts versus opinions, you should. And if that means you need to do research to understand whether that's factual or not, then you should do it. Even if it's heuristic or even if it's something elemental, try to deal in fact, because a lot of the people that you're dealing with don't like the esoteric that we as designers often live in. 
to the degree you can, you should provide meaningful metrics. So if you believe that something is, is good and you believe that it's going to improve a circumstance or a situation, try to provide some metric by which you think you'll be able to show that improvement. And, and it can be silly stuff, but, but do your best to try to metricize uh, the, the change from what you're proposing versus what has been. Um, to the degree you can, you should try to remove anecdote uh, from your decision-making process, okay? And it, it can't be uh, you suspect this or I showed this to my brother's, you know, uh, dog groomer and they thought it was a really cool idea. <laughs> you, you need to make it something that's more substantive than just anecdote, okay? And frankly, you need to be a bit of an opportunist. And what I mean by that is when you find people in the organization, uh, be it wherever you work, uh, non-designers that, that are willing to work with you, or as uh, I'm stealing the phrase from, uh, uh, oh geez, I'm drawing, drawing a blank, uh, Bob, uh, oh geez, Bob Schwartz. Bob Schwartz would always use the phrase co-conspirators. And so for example, like in, in the company I'm in right now, engineering can often be challenging to work with because they're very time pressurized to do things. So what we've found is we have a lot of co-conspirators in the manufacturing organization. So what we'll often do is if we have an idea and the engineers tell us that they would find it very challenging to execute that, we've actually already talked to the manufacturing guys like, oh no, we, we know how to do that. We can figure that out. So the idea is that we're finding the people that will help be allied with us in, in moving our ideas forward and, and work with them as co-conspirators. Like we just talked about, you wanna make sure that you read the room and pay attention. Uh, I, one of the disadvantages of a Zoom meeting <laughs> versus an in-person meeting is I can't see everybody's face to see whether you're falling asleep or whether you're, you're attentive but I think those are the kinds of things that you need to really pay attention to. Do not go through your script just for the sake of going through your script. If you don't see people tuned in or, or paying attention, uh, tough in this climate, but someday we'll get back to in-person conversations. And the last three are kind of big ideas. Make sure you're always providing value to not just the value you see it, but value through the lens of the people that you're doing work for. And the last two are just always be nice and don't be not nice, I guess is how I would put it. So um, hopefully that's, uh, oh, I just realized I animated all these things. So in, uh, in summary, I guess one of the things that I just wanna take us back to is you're going to make mistakes over the course of your career. Um, you're gonna have good days and you're gonna have bad days. Um, you're gonna do stuff right and wrong. And I think the best thing you can do is, is just do your best and acknowledge um, when you've done it right and when you've done it wrong and, and tune into what you did that worked and what you did that didn't work and try to try to take those those moments away and learn from them. So, but you really need to know how you can provide value and use the tools that you have to help more than just the product that you're developing. I think there's a lot of designers that, that don't do that. And it's, it's unfortunate because they're equipped. They just don't recognize that, that that's a transferable skill to, to help themselves in, in the journey of, of organizational culture. And to be perfectly frank, I guess, the last thing is, is just have your, have your crap together. <laughs> like when you, when you go into meetings and when you do stuff, don't just think of it as the reasons that you did it uh, and the reasons that it matters to you. Think about all the things we talked about. Think about the motivations and interests of others and, and be selfless with getting your crap together and, and thinking about what other people need to hear from you, not just what you want to share. Okay. So I want to go back and close this out because let's assume that we now have better relationships and we now have access to uh, other people that can help us with our bread, right? So we've, we've got people that might be able to provide us with the right pot and with the right oven. So 
Once you've got that pot, you need a pot with a lid. And what you're going to do is put that dough in the pot. After you've left it in an oven that's been sitting at 500 degrees, you preheat that pot, you throw the bread in, preferably use cast iron or something like that. It's going to hold a lot of heat. You put the dough in, you put the lid on, you let it cook for 20 minutes, you don't touch it. And then after 20 minutes, you pull the lid off and you let it cook for an additional five minutes. And it's going to be some of the best bread you can possibly make for yourself.